This is Eduardo Ariño de la Rubia. I'm the Chief Data Scientist at Domino Data Lab. And uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, how to use the K-nearest neighbors algorithm and some interesting pitfalls about it and just, you know, just some interesting stuff about the algorithm and we'll discuss some different implementations. At the highest level, I wanted to just, you know, touch on the agenda. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about my favorite subject, me. I promise I'll keep it short. An even shorter introduction to Domino. Then really the meat and potatoes of this webinar is going to be what is the K-nearest neighbors algorithm. Uh, it's a pretty intuitive algorithm. It's one of those algorithms that everybody sort of is aware of. But I just well, I want to make sure that we can develop a good intuition about what it is and when it's applicable. Then we'll actually dive into uh, some of the Python and R packages that implement K-nearest neighbors. Um, there's a pretty rich ecosystem, and although K-nearest neighbors is one of those algorithms that everybody sort of can implement on their own, there's a lot of really neat modifications that exist and really cool extensions that allow you to take on different dimensionality, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And in the final section, we will actually cover, uh, we'll show some models being trained, and we'll discuss the runtime complexity and all of that about it. So, you know, first, a uh, little bit about me. Hopefully I'll convince you that I'm worth listening to. I'd like to start off with a couple of pictures. Uh, I've been programming computers since the early 80s. That was in Clear CX Spectrum. It was my first computer. Uh, married to a, my lovely wife, Lee, and those are my three dogs. Uh, given a choice, I'd rather give a webinar about my dogs, but I don't think that nearly as many of y'all would have signed up. Just a little bit of timeline of my involvement with machine learning and what we now call data science. Uh, in 1997, I was fortunate enough to get my first account on a supercomputer. It was a MassPAR MP1 with 1,024 processors. And at that point, I kind of fell in love with using soft approaches to solve hard problems, uh, went on to genetic algorithms. In 1999, I actually hired my first machine learning engineer at a dot-com that I was the CTO of. I was convinced that you could take uh, users' buying patterns and use a neural network to figure out what to upsell them and that that would end up being a good idea. Uh, it's probably one of my best ideas that I never ever profited off of. Uh, it's one of those things that now kind of seems you know, reasonable and unavoidable, but back then I, I guarantee you I had to fight tooth and nail to hire uh, my first ML engineer. Uh, from there, uh, I basically have been involved in machine learning, lots of different fields from robotics and vision systems to job shop scheduling, neural networks and LP. And uh, recently in the last year, I became the chief data scientist at Domino Data Lab. So that's enough about me. A little, just a quick little bit about Domino. So Domino is a data science platform. It lets you run uh, your code uh, on the cloud. It uh, has a really neat reproducibility engine to capture everything. We'll be going into that. Uh, it's just, it's the tool that I use for data science, and uh, hopefully you'll see some stuff that you like. So, but let's actually dive in, into what is K-nearest K neighbors, why do we care, uh, how does it scale, what does it matter? So, to talk about K-nearest neighbors, first, I think we need to make sure everybody understands what machine learning is. Now, you all signed up for a machine learning webinar, so I'm pretty sure you know what it is, but I, I want to cover it. So, machine learning is this idea that you can have computers learn something without being explicitly programmed. Uh, what that means is really straightforward, is we can come up with hand-coded rules. And in the vision world, for example, it used to be all about uh, creating uh, finely tuned hand-coded features like, oh, this feature looks like a wheel and this feature looks like a road. And what we've discovered instead is that if you feed algorithms data, they can actually learn patterns that are much more advanced than anything that we could viably hand code. Now, there's really three branches of machine learning. Uh, finding a category, right? You want to find out if something's defective, if somebody's fraudulent, that sort of thing. Finding a number, you want to approximate uh, you know, production yield or like everybody else, you take your first machine learning course and you decide that you're going to apply it to the stock market and you discover that finding a number and finding a number that makes you money on the stock market are two different things. And uh, finding structure, uh, something like uh, you, you have unlabeled data. So those first two are, uh, are supervised learning. You have data and you have a target that you want to approximate. This first one, finding structure, is when you don't have labeled data and you want to under, understand something about the underlying data generating process. Um, 
we won't get into that. There's some really neat uh, k-nearest neighbors-like algorithms, like a k-means clustering for finding structure, and maybe we'll be covering clustering in a uh, future webinar. But for now, we're really going to talk about k-nearest neighbors, which is for finding categories and finding numbers. Uh, in particular, though, we're going to talk about categorical approaches because I'm I'm not really crazy about k-nearest neighbors for regression. So what is k-nearest neighbors? Uh, k-nearest neighbors is a really simple algorithm. The, the basic idea is that it's a lazy instance-based learning algorithm. What that means is it doesn't generalize. Uh, almost every other machine learning algorithm, you feed it a vast data set, and from that data set that you've passed, it creates internal data structures and internal uh, gradients and, and weights that generalize or extract some, uh, some underlying truth from the data set. K-nearest neighbors does not do that at all. In a K-nearest neighbors algorithm, particularly a naive implementation, it literally stores all of the data and uh, there is no real explicit training phase. During that training phase, all you're really doing is lo loading the data. It is when you score something that it goes through and it compares this new variable, this new uh, record that you've passed to it, and it goes through and it compares it against all of the data that it previously stored, finds some distance metric, and from there uh, gives it the value. Uh, I, I know that's a little abstract, so I actually like to develop an intuition in simple one-dimensional data. So. This is a very, very simple data set of heights. And uh, basically, it just has a gender. Uh, gender is either one or two. And heights is the heights in inches. Now, so if we visualize this data set, we can see that it's not linearly separable. Uh, by linearly separable, I mean we can't really draw a line where the uh, data set is either in one, uh, is either gender one or gender two. So there is some nonlinearity non to it. A k-nearest neighbors algorithm here, what it basically is saying is you're saying for any height that you pick, for whatever number of neighbors that you pick, three, five, however it is, go ahead and find those nearest neighbors. Uh, it, so, for example, if I pick 70 right here uh, and I say that, you know, I have the four nearest neighbors, for example, it would find, uh, it would find three of these blue ones, gender two, and maybe it would find one of these uh, uh, of these red ones, which is gender one. So a new record added to 70, so, so a new record comes in and says, this is a, you know, this person's 70 inches tall. Realistically likely, realistically they're likely to be gender number two. Uh, almost everyone else starts K-nearest neighbors algorithm on two-dimensional data, but I think it's really useful to envision it as a line. A, a wrong and possible intuition is to imagine that you're finding the average height for both of the classes, and you're basically splitting there, and any new record calculates the distance between the new point and the, mi the midpoint of the class space. Uh, so you can see here, it kind of splits it exactly where you would expect. Um, in this particular scenario, this data set, this particular intuition actually scores the same as almost any k-nearest neighbors approach. So, yeah, so that's the fundamental intuition of k-nearest neighbors. When a new point shows up, you want to figure out the distance between it and some number of neighbors on the same space, and you're going to take on the class value of the most neighbors. A two-dimensional example is pretty straightforward. So we have, you know, in this x and y dimension, and we have dots that are red dots, we have blue dots, uh, we have green dots, and then this new gray dot appears right here that the arrow is pointing to. So suppose we wanted to predict the color of the gray dot. So this is a pretty straightforward, it's just three steps. Fundamentally, we pick a number for k, and it's important, k, uh, there, there is no direct analytical approach to find the right k. Uh, usually you, what you end up doing is you end up doing cross-validation and you end up doing a grid parameter search where you test many, many k's and you find out for your particular data set, for your covariates at a particular point in time, what is the uh, right k? It's important to note that this k is in no way, shape, or form universal. Uh, for different data sets, the optimal k is going to change. Uh, even for the same data set across time as underlying covariate shift, the k is going to shift. So you pick a number for k. This is done with, again, with cross-validation or other heuristics. 
uh, you find the color of its k neighbors using some distance metric. Uh, so by distance metric, I literally mean in that space, you calculate like the square root and the change in x squared plus the square root uh, uh, plus uh, the change in y squared. Uh, just you know, traditional Pythagorean theorem stuff. Although there's, it should be noted that there's other interesting distance metrics. There's Manhattan distance, which is basically when you're only allowed to do right turns. There's Minkowski distance. There's all, all kinds of really interesting distance metrics. But as a rule, folks usually use Euclidean distance. So you then find what are the k points that you picked that are closest to it. So let's say that we picked three. And uh, you find the three closest points, you find the most dominant color, and then you assign it that new color. So in this particular scenario, if we look over here, right, the three closest points are this one, this one, and this one. So the new dot is blue. Hopefully that's intuitive and it makes some level of sense. So real quick, so what are the pros? of k-nearest neighbors. Well, k-nearest neighbors is powerful. It can learn nonlinear problems. Almost every other algorithm that is as simple to understand and intuitive as k-nearest neighbors is a linear classifier or linear regressor at some point. Uh, it's really simple to implement. Uh, k-nearest neighbors can be implemented just as a simple, you know, couple of loops, basically iterating through a list of points. Uh, it doesn't require advanced linear algebra for the naive case. It's just a straightforward uh, algorithm that you can implement and explain. There's a flexibility in the number of features and distance choices. Because it's sort of a, a, this, this generalized algorithm, like I said, you can, pick, uh, you can pick Euclidean distance, you can pick Minkowski distance, and there is no hard, fast rule about which one it is that will be the right answer. Um, but it, again, that flexibility is really, really powerful because you can tune it to your particular scenario. Perhaps one of the most beautiful aspects of k-nearest neighbors is that it is one of the classifiers that, being incredibly simple and straightforward, naturally handles multi-class cases. So if you look at the image on the left, that's actually a decision surface of a k-nearest neighbors algorithm. So you can see that it's got green, you know, blue, and red that it's trying to classify into. Uh, if you've ever tried to build a multi-label classifier using something like logistic regression or even just other straightforward machine learning algorithms, you know uh, it's actually handling multi-class cases is challenging. It requires a great deal of effort on your part, uh, or it requires using a library that you know somebody has already done all the work. Uh, nearest Neighbors just handles it out of the box. Uh, one thing I would like to note, uh, nearest Neighbors is really, really easy to overfit. And uh, if you actually look at the decision surface on the left, you can see a few places where it could be argued that, uh, well, actually, let me take a second. Uh, let me define overfitting. Overfitting is when a machine learning uh, algorithm doesn't really learn, it memorizes. Uh, so uh, even though k-nearest neighbors doesn't generalize, we want the behavior of k-nearest neighbors to be one of generalization. Uh, here, for example, you could argue that this little red node over here on the right uh, Yes, yeah, sure, there are some red points there, but if you look at the broader overall pattern, there's a lot of blue. So Kenier's Neighbors is pretty cool. It handles multi-class cases, uh, but it can overfit. Uh, and the last pro is that it really can do really well in practice with enough representative data. There's some caveats there as to what enough representative data means, and we'll get into sort of the major pitfall k and here in the next slide. Uh, but it really can, you know, the the I think the the best example of that is uh, you know, quite a few years ago, the Netflix prize came out. And uh, one of the secrets to the winner's prize was that it was a whole bunch of meta estimators that uh, were all joined together via a k-nearest neighbor estimator. And uh, there was a ton and ton and ton of data. And it was some really complex decision surfaces. And k-nearest neighbors was able to do it really well. So the cons, which are probably pretty intuitive at this point, is that if you've got a million data points that you're I, that, that you've got in your data set for k-nearest neighbors, that means that for every new data point, the k-nearest neighbors algorithm is going to compute for all million data points. Uh, even if you parallelize it, even if you distribute it, we'll actually get into this at the very end of my, of my webinar, uh, that's still a preposterous amount of space, uh, of time. Uh, you know, checking distances over and over and over again uh, will just burn up a lot of CPU cycles. And if you find yourself constantly having to score against very large data sets, k-nearest neighbors is probably not for you. Uh, you know, tied directly to that is the fact that you're storing all of this training data. 
So whereas something like a linear model is just the coefficients and something like a, uh, you know, a, a, a card or a, or a tree or even a random forest is just a number of trees, they don't actually store all of the original training data. K nearest neighbors really does store all the training data. So if you're trying to run them in an embedded scenario or low memory situation or just really you care about how much RAM you're using, K nearest neighbors is problematic. And perhaps the hardest thing about K nearest neighbor is that Kenner's neighbors is that you have to know you have a meaningful distance function. Uh, like the distance between one point and another has to mean something. And I'll get into that here in a second, but that's surprisingly tough to do, um, especially when you have non trivial data sets. So, again, though, so why do we even need other algorithms? Okay, Kenner's neighbors is great, it learns linear and nonlinear relationships, it basically trains in real time. Uh, why isn't it the most common machine learning model in production? Well, if you've taken a machine learning course or if you haven't, this is one of the, one of the biggest truisms. It's the curse of dimensionality. Uh, it's, let's see if I can help you develop some intuition. Uh, in two-dimensional space, right, if we just got an X and a Y axis, that each one of the dimensions, it's easy to see how they contribute to the estimator. As the amount of, uh, of dimensions goes up, Again, k nearest neighbors is just figuring out a distance value. So, for each new, for each new dimension that you add to the k nearest neighbors search space, you increase the total volume by an exponential, which means the ability to discern the distance goes down by an exponential. The end result is this final, really this final paragraph. This is what matters: is if a, if each point is just a single number, eight bytes then an effective k nearest neighbor estimator for just 20 dimensions requires more training data than the current estimated size of the entire internet to truly be discerning. And this is the fundamental problem. If you've got a data set that has a lot of dimensionality, k nearest neighbors is not for you. Um, so this really, this is one of the nice things about k nearest neighbors is that it's pretty easy to look at your data set and know whether it's going to work for you or it isn't. So there's a couple of other issues with k nearest neighbors. Uh, uh, distances have to be comparable. Uh, this makes, uh, so for example, if you're doing a k nearest neighbors and one of your distances uh, is, uh, I don't know, a GPA, right? Uh, so it's from a zero if you're a terrible student to a four. And uh, your other uh, distance, your other um, feature that you're looking at is salary. And, you know, you've got salaries ranging from, you know, $20,000 a year up to $300,000 a year. Those two dimensions are incredibly incompatible. A dimension that only goes from zero to four and a dimension that goes up to, from zero to 250000 those are very, very difficult to deal with. So uh, in order to handle k nearest neighbors correctly in production, the most important thing you have to do is you have to scale your data, you have to pre-process them, you have to feature, you have to do whatever it takes to make sure that your different dimensions are comparable against each other. Uh, also, handling categorical data is really hard. So, k nearest neighbors works really, really well if all of your features are numeric and they're all on the same scale. But real-world data is very, very rarely like that. Most real-world data has some categorical information. So the example, the canonical example I give is the days of the week, right? Monday, Tuesday, dot, 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 Sunday. Uh, the intuition is, oh, well, I'll just assign numbers to that, right? Like Monday will be one, Tuesday will be two, and then I've transformed them into numerical data. Well, even there you've got a problem because the distance between Sunday and Monday is huge. And as anyone who's ever had to, you know, go back to work after a long week, after a weekend, the distance between Sunday and Monday is not real long. It comes real quickly. And that, you know, the numbers at least have some semblance of ordinality to them. Uh, there's the challenge of what happens when you need to create categorical values that literally don't have any ordinal arrangement, like colors, for example. Uh, you know, is, is blue and yellow closer than blue and red? Well, maybe under some color theory or some spectrum of color wheel, but then if you turns out you need an additive color scheme instead of a subtractive color scheme, the ordinality doesn't even work that way. So the management of categorical data is really, really tough with k nearest neighbors. And uh, there are some packages that automate that for you, which we'll cover in uh, the next to last section, but it's just something to be aware of. Uh, and pre-processing. Uh, like I said, 
k-nearest neighbors works really well when you've got a small number of dimensions that have a lot of data where all of the dimensions are numerical and they're all on the same scale. There are, you know, in my entire life as a data scientist, I can probably count on one hand the number of data sets that fit that description. Almost all data sets uh, do not fit that description. That means that you've got to have a pretty robust pre-processing step in place. Uh, what it also means is that you have to serialize that pre-processing pipeline and make sure that when you deploy your k-nearest neighbor model into production that you're taking the same exact steps to pre-process. So whatever the normalization you took for the min, the max divided by the mean to normalize the value between 0 and 1 or whatever it is for the training set, you have to capture all of that data and you have to do so in a really faithful fashion to put it into production. Uh, otherwise the scaled values that will come through will be incorrect or even worse, you won't, you won't remember to scale the values and k-nearest neighbors will absolutely not um, not converge on anything or give you reasonable answers. Uh, there are a lot of algorithms that are nowhere near as uh, fragile when it comes to pre-processing, especially sort of something like uh, gradient boosted trees or random forests that uh, can take raw features and do intelligent things with them. Uh, K-nearest neighbors is absolutely not one of those algorithms. You have to have an incredibly thorough and tested and deployable pre-processing step that makes sure to get your data uh, with the same covariance and the same distribution as the training data. When you've got limited dimensionality, so right, if you're looking at uh, numeric data and you've got six or seven columns and uh, it's all numeric, it's really, really great. Uh, number two, uh, this is one that I, I, I have a lot of conversations with folks about. Uh, in production, oftentimes you have to train thousands if not millions of models, particularly if you're doing something like k-nearest neighbors content recommendation or you're doing k-nearest neighbors for yeah, just a, any kind of recommendation or classification on real-time data. Let's say that you've got a million users and you want to train a model for each one of those. Uh, but you don't know which users are going to show up when, right? You don't know which users are going to actually hit your system when. It can be really, really nice to train a very high-level model with k-nearest neighbors because, again, training basically fundamentally takes zero's time and just serialize that model off to the side because you will only pay the penalty of actually making a prediction and you know, pay the, the, the power cost and the CPU and, and the latency when you actually make a prediction. So if you're in a scenario where you've got a million users and you want to have a million customized models every single time for them, uh, it's really only 1,000 of them are going to be exercised every day, look into k-nearest neighbors. It can save you a lot of heartache and it can do some really nice things for deployment. Um, you want to use it for mostly numerical data. I covered that in point one, but uh, really, I don't almost argue you really want to use it when it's all numerical data. Like I said, you can do some things for categories, but with numerical data, it really shines. And k-nearest neighbors is great if you've got nonlinear relationships in the data. If you've got, if your data is linearly separable, there's much simpler algorithms, like I mean, logistic regression, as long as it's not multi-class. Uh, if there's any chance that there's nonlinear relationships in the data and it fits this limited dimensionality, mostly numerical data space, k-nearest neighbors is a really, really powerful algorithm. So when not to use k-nearest neighbors, again, it's almost like the negative complement of, of my previous slide, uh, if you've got high dimensionality, if uh, you're doing NLP, for example, and you've got TF-IDF and, and you've got, you know, a million words that it could be, don't use k-nearest neighbors. Number two, uh, if there's lots of sparseness in missing data, since we're always going back to that distance metric, any sparseness and missing data can just cause a lot of difficulty. Uh, mixed categorical data, it can be handled, and there's packages that handle it, but it's not really optimal. And the final point of when not to use k-nearest, uh, when scoring latency matters. So again, when you're scoring uh, in, uh, and by scoring I mean predicting. When you're predicting with uh, almost any other machine learning algorithm, you've paid the penalty of figuring out how to predict up front in the training phase. So you can get very, very fast predictions. Uh, k-nearest neighbors is not a fast predictor. Uh, if you're looking at something and you've got a very limited latency budget, you've got 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds of scoring latency, uh, k-nearest neighbors may be for you if the amount of data that you're using to train is very limited. So we only have to check that distance metric every once uh, for a small, uh, small n. But if it's a large n, you're going to have incredibly high scoring costs. And I'll actually show that here. Oh, I'm running out of time uh, in the last few minutes. So 
Finally, let's talk about some Python and R packages uh, that implement k-nearest neighbors and sort of the, the fun differences between them. Uh, so let's talk about R first. Uh, so there's some nice stuff available on CRAN. Uh, if you don't use Carrot already, I would really suggest you use Carrot. It was invented by Max Kuhn, and it's kind of like the Swiss Army chainsaw of modeling inside of R right now. Uh, Max Kuhn actually implemented his own k-nearest neighbors inside of Carrot, and it works real well. All of the examples I'll be showing in this next little section use Carrot. Um, there's also another package called k k-nearest neighbors. So one of the things that we were discussing is that whenever it is that k-nearest neighbors is scoring, sort of every point is uh, weighted the same. Uh, k k-nearest neighbors adds this concept of a weight to each uh, exemplar. So how important it is or how important it is based on the distance. Uh, it does it does it really really well, um, and you know, just you play around with it to see if a weighted k-nearest neighbors gets you some more uh, more accuracy. FNN is a really cool package that it's basically uh, an ultra fast ne uh, nearest neighbors search. The way it does that is that uh, the naive k-nearest neighbors scores everything. Uh, like I said, just has a very very basic data structure where it's uh, comparing every point against every other point, and that search space can take a while. FNN actually builds uh, more advanced data structures. It builds uh, KD trees and cover trees. Uh, what this basically means is that you do pay a train pe training penalty up front. After all, you're building a data structure, and building a data structure is free. It's not free, but the actual retrieval, the actual scoring is much, much faster. It's instead of being uh, O to the, you know, O to the N, it's O to, o to the log base 2 of N, which uh, really makes a lot of difference when you've got large data sets. Uh, K and NCAT, if you are, you know, if you're, for some reason, you're determined to do categorical data and, uh, and you want to do uh, k-nearest neighbors, uh, the K and NCAT package actually provides a really nice uh, implementation of categorical support in k-nearest neighbors. Uh, it is not supported in Carrot, so you have to uh, operate it uh, manually. And, uh, but it can really do some really nice things. Uh, I, I don't have time to get into it, but the paper is a really good paper to describe exactly what those optimizations are. And then there's RAN. Uh, basically, it is, supports approximate searches. It already ha it has KD trees. And it has something called a fixed radius search, which means that it actually only searches a subset of the points. Uh, that can be really, really powerful, and it can speed up your k-nearest neighbors algorithm. So for Python, actually, you, Python people kind of have it set for this. Uh, Scikit-learns k-nearest neighbors classifier kind of does everything that all the different R packages do, um, except for k and ncat. It, it off, just right off the bat, it does weighted k-nearest neighbors with uniform, distance-based. You can even pass it a custom callback function for deciding what the weights are. It's really quite powerful. It already optimizes with ball tree, KD tree, and brute force algorithms. So right off the bat, it really it's it's a pretty advanced k-nearest neighbors implementation. And finally, something that I discovered, which really blew my mind, is that right out of the box, it's it's fully parallelized. So if you pass an n jobs parameter when you actually construct the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, uh, when it scores, it'll use as many cores as necessary. So it's really really powerful. I think this is. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm a pretty big R proponent, but uh, I have to be honest, the scikit learn k nearest neighbors classifier is really, really, really a great, great classifier. So, uh, real quick, we're actually running out of time, but I did want to show you just some actual models in production, so I'm going to be switching over. So, here we are uh, just inside of Domino, in case you've never seen Domino, this is Domino. Uh, so, let's see. Um, I wanted to show, so for example, here it is that I've been training uh, k-nearest neighbors uh, to, to uh, the Higgs data set. If you're not here, I'll actually jump over to here. If you're not familiar with the Higgs data set, uh, the Higgs data set, oh wait, no, that's the airline data set. Uh, the Higgs data set is, uh, was, uh, came out of uh, Europe where they're actually doing, trying to find the Higgs boson, and this is synthetic data of actually detecting the Higgs boson. So again, it's, it's a little, it's a few too many columns, right? But it's numeric, it's, uh, it's well scaled, it's well behaved. So let's try some k-nearest neighbors on it. Uh, I was able to go through, and so for example, we train it here on a point, uh, 0.1 million, and we can see that the accuracy is uh, on a test set. Actually, hold on, let me scroll up here. So the accuracy without it being scaled is uh, 0.5916. If we go down here, the accuracy with it being scaled is 0.5986. So just scaling the inputs, uh, 
just scaling the inputs actually is pretty powerful. Um, let me one qu real quick actually pull this one up and compare it to, say, this one. So here we're actually going to compare what happens when you go from 0.01 million to 0 0.0001 million. So obviously there's a big difference in the data set. Um, in data set size. So here we can scroll down. So one of the nice things that Donna does is it captures plots. So we see that for the small data set, actually, uh, the uh, the grid search saw that you know five neighbors provided this accuracy, nine neighbors provided a lower accuracy. Uh, the seven neighbors had a much higher accuracy, and this was a smaller data set. For the larger data set, you notice that the accuracy keeps going up. Uh, I think that's to be expected. This, I think, on the unscaled data. Uh, yeah, so uh, on the scale data, actually, we see a real similar thing that it drops off uh, for the uh, smaller data set and it goes up on the higher data set. Uh, but if we actually look at the accuracy scores, let's scroll down a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> well, rather, let me make sure that I've got this right. Yeah, so uh, rather interestingly, when comparing to, uh, okay. So this is a bad comparison. This is something I like about Domino. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was only scoring like four records here, so in these four records, it's pretty easy to get a high accuracy. Let's go back and actually let's let's look at a better comparison real quick. Let's see what is going on here. Um, oh, here we have one that ran with point. So it ran on point one million, and let's compare this one to this point of one million. And let's do a, com a side by side comparison here. So uh, we're doing 0.1 million versus 0.01 million rows uh, again. So now we've got enough data that you can expect, you know, as the, as the neighbors goes up, it goes up, it, uh, the accuracy goes up. Um, let me actually go down to the accuracy metrics. So this is what you would expect. You would expect that uh, with more data, the accuracy went up from 0.59 uh, to a 0.6064 uh, for unscaled. Uh, for scaled, though, this is a big, big jump, right? By scaling the data, we went from an accuracy of 0.5986 to an accuracy of 0.6389. So there was a, a lot of accuracy to be gained by adding more data and by scaling. Oh, uh, I see that I have a question, actually. Let me go ahead and take it. Uh, the question is, if you have highly dimensional space, any thoughts on how effective k nearest neighbors is if you use off-the-shelf dimensionality reduction like PCA? So PCA is beautiful, uh, principal component analysis. Uh, it, it may, honestly, it might make sense for us to do another webinar of PCA at some point in the future. The, the answer is that you know, PCA finds a linear combination that captures as much variance as the original, uh, of the original data set in a generated data set. Uh, the, the, the short answer is that if the data lends itself to capturing variance via PCA, and uh, uh, lowering the number of dimensions with PCA can help k nearest neighbors, but you've added uh, a uh, you've added an extra layer of complexity. Um, so I know that that's, that's kind of a weaselly answer. Uh, I wish I had a better answer like yes or no, but it comes down to does your data actually like perform in uh, in PCA in such a fashion that uh, you you capture enough variance while not removing any of the uh, any of the feature space that would actually allow you to do things. So, anyways, uh, back back to the back to the demo. So uh, here I was, I was I was just saying that, and this is a pretty straightforward uh, pretty straightforward conclusion uh, based on what we know about Kenyers neighbors now. Uh, more data equals more accuracy, uh, and scaling equals uh, higher accuracy. Uh, this is so to be clear. Uh, here is the scaled value. So uh, accuracy on scaled is 0.6389. Accuracy on unscaled is 0.6064. You know that's you're getting 0 0, uh, 0 0.03 uh, uh, extra accuracy just by scaling the data. You're not actually paying any real penalty. So let's see. Is there anything else cool I can show you? So one of the things that was actually kind of interesting uh, is. So you'll notice, so this is uh, uh, this record right here is I was training it on the airline data set. If you're not familiar with the airline data set, is the, the, the KDD like sort of famous uh, uh, data set. Training it on uh, 0.01 million records took 13 minutes. So, uh, so I should be clear. When I say training here, I'm actually not just training. I'm actually training and scoring and cross-validating. You can actually see over here that it's training with a number of Ks. It's capturing information about the accuracy. So this isn't just a raw training step. It's actually training and scoring. That's why it takes so long. Uh, so something that I think is interesting to note, though, is that with 0.01 million records, it took 13 minutes. For 0.1 million, it's actually, I was kind of hoping this would be done by now, but it's taking 
one hour and 35 minutes. Um, why is this? Again, it's because for every new point that you add in the scoring phase, you have to, in this case, 10 times the data. This really highlights what it is that I was talking about, just the raw amount of processing that can be eaten up by, uh, by having a lot of data and you, the penalty you pay in scoring. Uh, one thing that I think, do I have any, is there any of the other airline trainings done? Uh, no, sadly not. But this is actually kind of cool. Let's go ahead and view the results here. Uh, you know, so uh, the airline data set, uh, if you're not familiar with it, just ha has information about whether flights are on time and delayed. Uh, accuracy goes up as the number of neighbors. Uh, accuracy uh, goes up here. What I think is, well, here it gives me some information about it. What, what I think is cool is if we look at the confusion matrix, uh, we've got an accuracy of 0.787, which is actually really, really high uh, when you think about it for figuring out if a flight is going to be delayed or not just uh, using a K nearest neighbors. But what I think is neat is this is another example of how scaling helps. By just pre-processing the data, uh, we go from an accuracy of 0.787 on the test set to an accuracy of 0.808. So that's a pretty high change uh, in accuracy, right? I mean, depending on, you know, if you're doing fraud detection or whatever your domain is, this can, this can actually make a really big impact on your bottom line, and you just have to make sure that you're scaling appropriately. So these are all, these are all in R. Uh, let me see if there's any other examples I want to show you. Higgs, do I want to show you? Let's see. So here's Higgs trained on... Point 0.1 and Higgs trained on point 0.1. I can't remember if we already did this comparison. Let me scroll to the bottom. Over here, let's see. Yeah, we did, 0.6064. I, 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 well, actually, 0.6389. I don't know if I remember this, but this is just another example of data and scaling and how important it is for pre-processing and can various areas. So that, that's, enough, that's enough R. Let's jump over to Python real quick. So I have here in Domino uh, another project, K and Python. I can just open up a Jupyter notebook, and I can sort of explore what I was doing. So uh, I didn't train the airline data set here. I literally just trained uh, the um, uh, on the Higgs data set because it's numerical and it's just easier. So here we have just a Jupyter notebook. I'll you know uh, I'll go through and execute it. Uh, so here we're reading the data set. We're printing it out. You know, we're basically creating our test train split because we are good data scientists. Here, we're, uh, you know, sklearn import k nearest neighbors classifier, number of jobs equals negative one. Now, it doesn't paralyze the training phase. And again, training is in air quotes, which you can't see. It paralyzes the scoring phase. So here we go. Let's go ahead and train that. That was pretty, pretty fast. Let's go ahead and actually score. So we're now scoring. This shouldn't take super long, right, because we're only at 0 .0001 million. Uh, and here we can get an accuracy score of 0.53. So again, it's better than a coin flip. It's, it's not amazing. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think I covered this about the k nearest nearest classifier and sklearn is that it automatically picks the right algorithm for you. Uh, what I mean by this is it automatically picks whether it's raw, it's KD tree, it's ball tree, and it uses some really nice heuristics to figure out exactly what it is that uh, that is the algorithm that makes more sense for your data set. This is all documented inside of the really, really good scikit-learn uh, uh, documentation. Um, you know, go ahead and check it out. You can obviously explicitly tell which algorithm to use. So one thing that I thought was neat is, again, to talk about the penalty of uh, of actually going through and and scoring, let me go ahead and open up another instance of the notebook. This one, let's see if it's finished. Oh, it actually, it doesn't look like it actually finished. So here it's a K nearest neighbor that has been trained on one million rows. So you saw how quickly it scored the other one, right? So I think I left this running for 30 minutes before to try to score a uh, couple of hundred thousand rows and it took forever. It actually didn't ever finish. So again, and this is even using the KD tree. Right, so this is using the optimized algorithm, and even with the optimized algorithm, K nearest neighbor scoring latency is just really, really problematic. So this goes back to what we said. Uh, if you want to use K nearest neighbors in production, if you care about scoring latency, that you can only use a small amount of training data because you pay the penalty for every time you score and uh, comparing against everything that has been stored. Um, but again, but you don't pay for it uh, during the training phase. So if your models may never be used, it makes sense. So. I believe that that's really most of the demo that I had. Let me make sure that I'm not missing anything here. 
uh, all of this, yeah, all of this is fine. All right, well, let me go ahead and see. Uh, I believe that that's it for my presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I'm turning over to my uh, to my coworkers, and they can let me know if there's any questions. Give me just one second while we figure it out. So one question that I have is that I was demoing using Kenyers Neighbors in Python and in R with some really large data sets, uh, how to avoid exhausting memory. Um, and uh, the answer, the short answer is have a lot of memory. Uh, due to the nature of the Kenyers Neighbors algorithm, uh, it, it just, it's going to store all of that data. So uh, make, sure that, make sure that that's possible. So let's see, I have another question. So uh, the question is, I tried using Kenyers Neighbors for missing data imputation, which is actually one of the really neat things that Kenyers Neighbors does pretty well. Uh, and the caret, uh, so caret actually, uh, the R caret package also has a KNN impute. Um, you know, the, but it was way too compute intensive for large data sets around greater than a million rows and could not complete the task. Is there a way around this? So now that you know sort of how the algorithm works, the, you know, you know that if you've got a million data sets, for each one, it has to compute distance across a million data, a million points. Um, I would suggest try using one of the more advanced algorithms. Uh, I, I, either the, um, when I was talking, if you're doing it in, in, in Python, you, you want to use something that automatically does uh, the, uh, what's it called, one second, uh, the fixed radius searching. So you could use RAN for R, or you could use uh, the Kenyers Neighbor classifier with some uh, interesting distance metric. Um, one of the, uh, that, that's basically, the other thing that you can do is parallelism. Uh, it's not a great answer, right, because it's only going to scale linear, a little, sub, little sublinearly to the number of cores. But, you know, if you've got a million rows and you really, really want to use Kenyers Neighbors because, for example, this is something that you only need to impute this data set once, and then you're going to be able to use that data set for six months. Maybe it just makes sense to find a box with a whole bunch of cores, use the fact that uh, the scikit-learn uh, parallelizes scoring, and take advantage of that for scoring. Uh, I will say uh, R does not parallelize for scoring. Uh, it does parallelize for, uh, for training care. It does a really good job of, for example, making sure the resamples go across all cores. But for scoring, you're still stuck to a single core. So I hope, I hope that answers it. Uh, so the next question. Yeah, so on the dimensionality curse problem, some people applying KNN to large dimensionality data prepare to pre-process the data through some form of dimensionality reduction and apply KNN. Does this bias in some way, in practice or theory, the resulting KNN algorithm, and in so how can someone reduce any such biases? So that's that's related to the uh, that's really related to to the previous question about PCA. You know, anytime you're adding a pre-processing step, you're you're taking the original so. So the way the data works in the real world, right, is there's some underlying data generating process which is happening in reality, and we're sampling that data. Um, that data that we're sampling uh, goes into our, you know, our CSV file or our database. Uh, running PCA on it is absolutely going to bias it. Like, you know, I, so I'm not a PCA expert. I've got some friends that actually, like, I've got one friend in particular, and she got her PhD in PCA, and I wish she was here to answer this question. But PCA is going to find a linear combination. Uh, if your data uh, loses a lot of its variance uh, because it's passed through a linear combination, then uh, you're going to lose that and you're going to bias your data set. Um, one thing that I would say is that, it, that the beautiful thing about this is that you can figure it out experimentally. What I would do is I would uh, make sure to build a pipeline that uh, pre-processes it properly, has, uh, has, it, uh, has it PCA properly. And then just make sure that, you know, when you, you've got your trained test validation script, understand the way that it biases it when you run it through PCA. Uh, you know, look at edge cases, look at, you know, look at outliers, see how they were treated. Because, you know, oftentimes uh, outliers are where something really interesting happens. Um, I would definitely, 
I, I, so I suggest doing it. I think that that is basically, that is the, you know, you have a lot of insight. That is the canonical way of handling highly dimensional data in KNN. Uh, but to be very clear, that, that's why people use other machine learning algorithms, is uh, because other machine learning algorithms do a really, really great job of, uh, of handling high dimensional data. Uh, this is, you know, this is, you know, even linear models, sparse linear models can sometimes really outperform it. Uh, something that may be useful uh, is I, I actually wrote a white paper on choosing a data science algorithm. Um, uh, it's a benchmarking models paper on our website. If you can go uh, check it out, uh, I think I think we just give it to you if you just enter in a form. Uh, yeah, I, I really go through the process of how it is that, that you pick that. Um, yeah, so that was a response to a question of a good guide for choosing data science algorithms. Obviously, I think I wrote a good guide. There's there's many out there. There's some great books uh, that you should you should always check out. You should check out uh, the Elements of Statistical Learning book. Uh, uh, I talked about Karen and Max Goon. His Applied Predictive Modeling book is, I mean, it's 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 on my desk and it's incredibly dog-eared. Now, what, one thing I forgot to add is uh, there was a question about how do I handle over a million rows. Uh, well. Parallelism, right? Uh, we actually, I, I don't know if we've announced it today or we're going to announce it in the next couple of days. Uh, Amazon X1 instances have come out, and X1 instances are amazing. Uh, and Amazon X1 instance gives you 128 cores and 2 terabytes of RAM. Yeah, uh, I, so I just found out that it's been announced. You can check it out on our blog. Actually, I'm going to do something a little dangerous. I'm going to go right to our blog right here. Oh, live demos are always fun. Yeah, so uh, right here. It's right on our blog. And these are big boxes. I mean, two terabytes of RAM is a silly, silly amount of RAM, uh, and 128 cores. I mean, it's just preposterous. With the uh, with the power of the scikit-learn uh, parallelization, uh, or even ours, uh, the parallelization via do parallel and crossfold, uh, you can get a lot done on an X1 instance in not a lot of time. So uh, I would definitely. This is one of those things where. Uh, Sometimes it's just a lot easier to put in on, on some big uh, hardware. Uh, so there's a, another great question. How does k uh, nearest neighbors handle missing data uh, or the accuracy of the data? I'm not sure what is meant by the accuracy. For, for handling missing data, the answer is not well. Uh, missing data really makes distance metrics tough, right? Like uh, what is the distance between anything to anything about itself? Uh, and uh, I would definitely... If you've got uh, a data set that you want to run k nearest neighbors on and you've got missing data, uh, the first thing that you want to do is you want to find a algorithm for imputing that missing data which, when tested against a holdout set, uh, performs in a reasonable fashion. Uh, rather interestingly, like somebody else mentioned, you can use k nearest neighbors to impute missing data. There's a great package, uh, create a function called KNN impute that does that. There's other approaches. You can RF impute. Uh, I kind of like the idea of using a random forest to impute missing data just to predict on K-nearest neighbors. Uh, if your data set has missing data, especially a lot of missing data, this is not the algorithm for you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. What is my favorite distance metric? Uh, the answer is whichever one it is that works. Uh, but uh, I've got a special place in my heart for the Manhattan distance metrics. So, um, Manhattan distance, again, it's basically built, if you've ever been to Manhattan, it's a whole bunch of blocks. Uh, basically, you, you can't go diagonally with Manhattan distance. You have to take a step up and a step right or a step up or a step left. Um, it's, uh, it has some really neat properties, but realistically speaking, uh, I have found that the choice and distance metric is a lot less important in a lot of real world scenarios. Uh, once you've gotten to the point where you can use K-nearest neighbors where your data set is not highly dimensional, your data set is numerical, your data set is properly scaled, your data set doesn't have a lot of missing data, uh, sure, you, I'm sure that I'm sure we could construct data sets that different distance algorithms provide a big bump. Uh, in true production, I, I've not found them. Uh, I like Manhattan distance from a theoretical standpoint. I think it's fun, but realistically, you probably want to stick with something like Euclidean distance or a, dis or a weighted Euclidean distance because you want to be able to understand it and have some intuition. Uh, one more question. Uh, can uh, you discuss optimizing K and choosing a gamma? Uh, I can, but I don't think my, I don't know if my answer is going to be real satisfactory. Uh, my answer is use a tool that does a really, really good job of, uh, let me see if I can find, uh, of basically doing a grid parameter search. You don't want to do this by hand, right? This is something that you want to have a tool that does n-fold cross-validation, that looks at your data set, 
and, uh, and experimentally using proper statistical processes really picks for that data set at that point in time, given the metric that you want to optimize for, it tells you what the right K is. Uh, so again, it's not, you know, there, I don't know of a closed form solution, I don't know of a really great answer, but I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a really practical answer. Just go ahead and use the distance, uh, use the tools that have been given to you. Uh, Again, so uh, uh, Scikit-Learn has a really, really fantastic grid search uh, algorithm. Uh, Carrot has a really stellar grid search algorithm you can, you can see right here. Use that. Be experimental. Get, get the data that you want. All right. Well, so I believe that was the last question. Uh, this has been really enjoyable. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks for being engaged. When you're doing a webinar and you can't see any faces, you, you don't really know if, you know if people are really there. So I really appreciate it. Uh, we will be doing these uh, pretty often. So just uh, reach, if you need to email me, I'm Eduardo, E-D-U-A-R-D-O, at Domino Data Lab. Uh, you know, let us know how we can be of service. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day. Cheers.